Our Story Production presents The Road to Our Story, spotlighting an in-depth look at many of The Road to Our Story magazine's featured articles. So get ready for you're about to travel on The Road to Our Story. Hi, I'm Jason Howland. Welcome to Speaking of Health, a place to help you learn how to live a longer and healthier life. Drinking a glass of milk, enjoying a fried egg, or eating a peanut butter sandwich, all things that most of us take for granted, but not someone with a food allergy to one or all of those foods. Food allergies are often misunderstood by the public, but make no mistake, a severe allergic reaction can be deadly. Our guest today is Dr. Kunal Shah. She is a Mayo Clinic Health System allergist. Dr. Shah, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, we are talking today about food allergies. Let's start off by talking about what exactly is a food allergy and what causes food allergies. So food allergies are when your immune system takes a food and a protein in it and, and considers it foreign or threatening. Our immune systems are there to fight anything that threatens us, bacteria or toxins. But in this situation, it takes something that should be natural, but instead it perceives it as foreign. And what it does is it tells its own cells to make immunoglobulin or antibodies, and it's called immunoglobulin E or IgE, to that food. Those then act as antennas. They attach to cells in your lungs, in your um, GI system, as well as on your skin. And then when that food protein comes by again, it perceives it. It sends a signal to those cells to create all the symptoms associated with food allergies to try to get rid of that, that threat. So really, it all boils down to your body is misunderstanding something. Exactly. Hmm. Um, so how common are food allergies? Are they very common? Food allergies are common, but not as common as everybody thinks. A true food allergy in children less than three was found in about, in about six to eight percent of children. But when you get to adults, you find about three percent of adults have food allergies. And this is because many food um, allergies can be outgrown, although you, you're never able to be cured, but you can be outgrown. Uh, food allergies really aren't as common as some um, people might think. What are some of the most common food allergens, things that people are actually allergic to? So the top allergens for food are milk, soy, wheat, eggs, shellfish, and regular fish, as well as peanuts and tree nuts. So, and what are some of the symptoms, if you're allergic to a food, uh, what are symptoms of an allergic reaction? So we had kind of talked about those, those immunoglobulin E being on the skin, the gut, and the lungs. So when they send that, that signal that to their cells when they see the food, it releases histamine histamine and other chemicals. What that causes is swelling of the lips, eyelids, tongue, throat, itching of the skin, hives on the skin, wheezing, cough, shortness of breath, as well as vomiting, diarrhea, and nausea. It can get um, so severe, actually, that you can have dizziness and loss of consciousness as well. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound very fun no. <laughs> at all. So uh, what about anaphylaxis? What is that? I've heard of that. So anaphylaxis is a fancy way of saying severe life-threatening allergic reaction. So that's when you have multiple of those systems involved, um, especially when you get to the point where the swelling in the throat is so bad that you can't breathe and your airway is cut off, or to the point where you're so dizzy um, and your blood pressure drops and you pass out. So that's what we call anaphylaxis. And if someone uh, is having an anaphylaxis reaction to a food, is it something that they can um, just wait it out or should they go to the ER right away? So if you have anaphylaxis, the only way to be saved is to be injected with epinephrine. People who know they have a food allergy carry um, inject injectable epinephrine on them. Mm -hmm. If you don't and it's a first reaction, um, immediately you need to call 911 because the am ambulance service at least has it um, or go to the ER. So uh, what's the difference between a food allergy and a food intolerance? Because I've heard of people being uh, lactose intolerant, for example. Does that mean that they're allergic to milk? Is that another way of saying it, or is it something else? It's, uh, Jason, this is a great point, and this is where people get so confused and think they have a food allergy. So food intolerance involves your digestive system, not your immune system. And what it is is that somewhere in your digestive system you cannot properly break down or digest certain foods. The example of milk is great. That's when you don't have enough um, milk 
enzyme, a milk sugar enzyme. So you can't break down the milk sugars. Or in celiac disease or gluten intolerance, your body can't digest um, wheat-based products or certain grain-based products that have gluten, and, it's, and it sits in the gut as a toxic byproduct and can cause symptoms such as bloating, um, abdominal pain, just like lactose intolerance causes abdominal pain, some people get diarrhea and vomiting. But those symptoms are all isolated to your GI system. They don't usually involve skin. They don't involve swelling. They're not life-threatening. And the difference with the intolerance is you end up developing an intolerance as you grow older or with extended exposure to a certain food, but not the first time you have it, not with the smallest amount, and it's not as severe as an allergy. And is it also gradual compared to uh, an allergic reaction, most of the times fairly immediate, right? Exactly. It is. It's gradual. Sometimes people develop um, their symptoms of an intolerance hours to days after having eaten that food. So, so just so we're clear, celiac disease, lactose intolerant, not food allergies at all. Exactly. Great. So, so how do you go about testing someone for a food allergy? So when they first come to an allergist, we get a good clinical history. We want to find out what food they ate, what combinations of food they had been eating, how often they've had that food, what kind of symptoms have they developed, and what was the timeline between when they first had the food and developed the symptoms. Then we go on uh, to do a testing. Testing usually involves a skin test where we take um, an extract, which is the isolated protein from the food. We place it on the skin using a plastic pricker that barely scratches your skin. Within 15 minutes, if you see a mosquito bite at that site, then you have a positive. We know that you have IgE or immunoglobulin E to that food. Alternatively, we use a blood test. In the blood test, we look for specific IgE to the food that you're allergic to. And that tells us that you have high levels of circulating in your blood, IgE, which means you're allergic. You can have other um, levels called IgG, but those don't reflect an allergy. So you have to be very specific in what kind of testing you get and how to interpret it. Next, if we still aren't completely sure, we move on to a food challenge. A food challenge is a great way to both diagnose an allergy as well as to see if you're outgrowing it or becoming tolerant to the food. Food challenges are when you're um, in a doctor's office because you want a controlled setting, but you're given small amounts of the food on a gradual basis, all while being monitored. And if you can tolerate that food and don't develop symptoms, you're not allergic. But if you develop symptoms, we treat it right away in the office, and we can say with 100% that that is your allergy. Because unfortunately, the testing for food allergies is not very specific or sensitive. You can have a positive but not be allergic to a food, and have a negative and actually be allergic to a food. And where this gets us into trouble is we don't want to tell anyone, um, especially children, not to eat a certain food when we're not completely sure. So r really, it sounds like the food challenge is probably one of the best ways for you as an allergist to properly diagnose someone uh, that they truly do have a food allergy because you can see it right, right. there firsthand. Um, in our community, that's the gold standard for, t for food allergy testing. So when someone has been diagnosed with a food allergy, how do you go about treating it? Or can you treat it? Can you cure it? Unfortunately, right now there's no cure. There is some research on, on various modalities that may help induce tolerance, but there's no cure. The way to treat it is um, education. We spend a lot of time in our office talking about how to read food labels, how to eat out, where to eat out, what questions to ask if you're eating a food that you yourself haven't prepared. Because it's difficult, you still want to maintain your same quality of life. You want to go out, you want to be at family members' homes and friends' homes, but you really have to know what questions to ask because sometimes it's not very obvious if, you're al if your food allergen is in the food you've eaten. Wearing a medical alert bracelet helps. We teach people to carry antihistamines and, epi and injectable epinephrine. We teach them how to use it, and we often train family members on how to use it too so that if you're in trouble, someone else can help you out. How about uh, medications? So like when someone has hay fever, uh, they can get um, prescription medications like Allegro or they can get over-the-counter things like uh, you know Sudafed, Benadryl, those kind of things. Do, th do you use those things when you have a food allergy or is it totally different? So there are some cases where it's a very mild allergy, um, just the skin is involved or you, you think you may have gotten exposed to something. Sometimes people will use something uh, like an antihistamine such as Benadryl um, for a mild reaction. 
but we never recommend eating, taking the antihistamine and then eating the food you're allergic to in the hopes that you won't react because in the long term you can make yourself worse or have the allergy persist for longer. What about uh, uh, not eating foods but uh, just coming in contact, touching food or breathing in um, uh, some of the, I guess, p particles that are in the air from the mm -hmm. food? Uh, is that also an issue for people that have food allergies? Certain people, if they also have asthma, um, and usually it's moderate to severe asthma, can get it, uh, that can be their trigger. So they can have an asthma flare when they've inhaled that food protein. Mm -hmm. Usually you need a lot of um, exposure by skin or by inhaling to develop the reactions of a food allergy. Um, but when you ingest it, the smallest amount should set you off. So it is something that occurs. It's something that causes a lot of anxiety in, in people, um, patients of ours, family. Mm -hmm. But usually, unless you have severe asthma, that, that's not the case. The best thing is just try to be as safe as you can. Avoid exposure as best as you can. Uh, what about, um, I've heard of uh, people that are allergic to uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, but only when they're raw, not when they've been cooked. What, what exactly is that? Yeah, that's a really interesting phenomena. It's called pollen food allergy or oral allergy syndrome. And what happens is, um, a good example would be apples, the part closest to the peel. The protein there looks a lot like birch tree pollen. So when you eat the raw apple, your body thinks you've eaten a fistful of pollen and it sets off this immediate reaction, itching, burning in your mouth. A lot of kids will spit out certain vegetables um, or fruits. But when it's cooked, the proteins unfold and they no longer look like birch tree pollen. So apple pie, applesauce, cause no symptoms. So it's not necessarily you're allergic to that food. It's the body uh, is mistaking that raw fruit for a, a pollen allergy that you already have. Exactly. Right? So if you treat the pollen allergy, that usually goes away, that sensation that you get with the certain mm -hmm. foods, because we call it cross-reactivity. They sort of react to both. Now, what about um, for folks that I'm, I'm thinking of uh, foods such as milk or eggs, really common foods when it comes to cooking. Um, you know, anything you bake pretty much has eggs or milk in it. Um, for folks that are allergic to milk or eggs, can they not eat those, those types of foods then? The, anything that's been cooked with even a small amount of, say, one egg or a small amount of milk? So um, that's a great place where an allergist can help you because it all depends on the level of your allergy. A lot of times we pick up kids' allergies because of their birthday cake. They ha that was their first exposure to egg, and that's where they reacted, even with that very extensively cooked egg. Mm -hmm. However, as you get older and you're outgrowing the allergy, or if you have a mild allergy, we can test you, and we can then do a challenge to what we call um, baked egg or baked milk. And once that egg or milk is extensively heated, if your allergies are on the milder end, you can tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And we can do a challenge, again, in the office in a controlled setting, using a little bit at a time. But if we find that you can eat that, then you go on eating baked eggs and baked milk. The research shows that you will become tolerant or outgrow that allergy sooner than if you let, let nature take its course. The nice part with that also is you don't have to be as strict about label reading because you know, or, or asking questions because you know they can tolerate that, that mm -hmm. little amount when it's extensively heated. But certainly folks that have those severe allergic reactions to uh, egg or milk, uh, they have to really watch everything that's cooked to make sure that those items aren't in there. Even though it's cooked, it's a small amount. Um, the, Exactly. Folks with, with severe reactions, they have to really watch out then, don't they? Exactly. If you're a severe reactor, if your levels of IgE to that food are very high, you will react even if it's extensively heated, even if you eat the smallest amount. So those patients have to be very careful. They have to question everything they eat or just eat stuff that they feel safe um, or that they've made at home themselves. So uh, any last words of advice for folks? Um, uh, if maybe they suspect they have a food allergy, they think maybe they had some sort of reaction to, to eating a type of food or touching a type of food, what should they do? The best bet is to see an allergist. An allergist is actually going to help find out whether you're truly allergic to or not. Do you really need to avoid this food or carry the epinephrine? If you do, they'll train you on how to avoid the food, how to take the medication if, if you have a severe reaction. But on the flip side, they may do a challenge and find you're not allergic to it, which would really make life easier because then you don't have to avoid that food anymore. They also can help explain that you might be having a food intolerance, but not a food allergy. 
that actually at least helps with peace of mind and anxiety, knowing that you're not going to have a systemic life-threatening reaction to that food. Great. Well, unfortunately, we're all out of time, but I'd like to thank our guest today, Dr. Kunal Shah, uh, allergist with Mayo Clinic Health System. Thanks for joining us today on Speaking of Health. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone, and be healthy. There you have it, folks, one of the favorite stories ripped from the pages of The Road to Our Story magazine. Let's have a look at another. Good day. I'm Connie Anthony, and welcome to another episode of Making a Difference, where together we continue to learn about businesses, organizations, and the people in our communities that are changing their world. Writer Colin Wilson said, The mind has exactly the same power as the hands, not merely to grasp the world, but to change it. Now let's take a look at organizations that are also changing their world. Thank you, Connie. We're excited to be back, and we're going to be talking about a great organization that's truly making a difference, and some of the people that are helping make that difference. Uh, today we have two exciting guests. We have... I'm Paul Steinhaus. I am uh, the principal at Martin Luther High School. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. And I am Robert Hall, former president of the Board of Directors at Martin Luther High School. Very good. Welcome, gentlemen. We're thrilled to have you. And uh, we know a little bit about your organization, but Paul, uh, share with us a little bit about the mission and uh, the goals that are set by your school. Uh, Martin Luther High School, is. Uh, we've been around since the mid-1980s. We've been working with families really to help promote and develop young Christian leaders. Okay. Okay. Uh, Bob, how long has the school been a school? The foundation of the school started way back, actually the year I was born, 1946, when the LEA was formed, the Lutheran Education Association, and it was formed by a group of pastors, laymen, and teachers in this area, looking about uh, creating a high school. And it uh, uh, progressed from there uh, very slowly, off and on, uh, there was a lot of interest, and then it would fade, and then the interest would regenerate. And eventually the school was really uh, started really in seriousness in 1980. And in 1980, there was a group that got together and started talking about and doing some planning and doing research and, and doing some surveying of the members of this area, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod members, to find out what uh, interest there was in creating and generating a high school. And so actually the school itself didn't start until 1983. So it took a couple, three sure. years to, to do all that survey and get all the background information. Were and there other schools and uh, things going on in the country or in the area uh, or the state, I should say, that you could role model or, or gain ideas from? Yes. One was um, uh, the school up in Mayor, it's Mayor Lutheran High School okay. in Mayor, again a Lutheran school. And they uh, had been operating for quite a few years by that time and were very uh, supportive and very uh, helpful in directing us in the way we should go and how we should proceed with it and so forth. The other one was uh, the, uh, the school up by uh, New Ulm, and that's a, a Wisconsin Synod uh, High School, and uh, they're, uh, they had been operating for just a relatively few years at that point, but again, very supportive and very helpful in, in our decisions and in our uh, research and in our work to develop a school. Where did the name come from and why the location? And tell us a little bit about the location that, that you're in. Okay, That is a very good question. Uh, the name came from the fact that the, in 1983 when the school was started, was the 500th anniversary of the birth of Dr. Martin Luther. So it was kind of a natural to sure. name it after him. Secondly, it was in Martin County. So we felt, okay, here we Perfect. go. Another Martin to, to, to amplify that Martin Luther High School. And then uh, as far as the location, it was felt that uh, the land that we had purchased, that the LEA had purchased before, was uh, in Fairmont, south of the high school, where the high, present high school is. And it was just felt that it was too much competition, too close to the major high school in the area. 
plus to draw some of the elementary children from the surrounding elementary schools, which were in Truman and South Branch and some other areas in the, the area, uh, Northrop was more centrally located for the, ch the population of the children that would be going to the school. And we just felt it was close to the border between the Truman School District and the Fairmont. The, the eligibility for busing would be better by sure. having it there. Sure. And it was just, uh, it felt like it was a natural location. And as far as the actual physical location on that site, on the north side, one of our dedicated uh, members that was very involved and very uh, supportive of the high school owned that land mm -hmm. and was willing to sell it to the Martin Luther for a reasonable price. And so that's why it was located where it is. And of course, it started in a little general store downtown, and we had to do really? a lot of remodeling. <laughs> and the the board and a lot of laymen went in and spent lots of hours putting up walls and putting up suspended ceilings and doing all kinds of cleanup. And so it wasn't in it isn't in its original location no, now. No, it is not. How long have you been in the location you're in now? Well, we were at that pr first site for two years. Okay. And we really outgrew it. And the, actually, the second year. We also used one of the rooms at the city hall for a classroom. Really? And we also, because we had no facilities for your gymnasium or for a kitchen, the children went over, or the students went over to uh, St. James Lutheran and had their hot lunch program there and used their gym for activities. That's very cool. Uh, today, uh, first of all, tell us how long you've been involved with the organization and uh, what you what drew you here. What drew me here? Yeah. Well, I've been here um, half a school year, so Welcome. or maybe three quarters of a school year at this point in time. So I'm I'm real new. So we're talking about you got the first and well, hopefully not the last. But <laughs> we are. I am I'm real new. So even some of the history that that Bob is bringing forward is uh, brand new to me too. I know a little of that history and the timing and all those sorts of things. Uh, what brought me here is uh, obviously a, a need for um, the job position. Mm -hmm. So they, they were looking for a principal. Uh, their former principal took a took a call. That's kind of how the, the church sure. operates within that ministry of a school. And so the, the principal took a call. And then they had one year of interim because they the principal took the call late in the school year and, and the board at that time didn't feel like it was fair to um, uproot somebody at the last second because the school he would be coming from would obviously be missing and it and just gets real late in terms of making those kinds of changes. So they did an interim, interim uh, position and that was held up by the faculty. They kind of divided it and conquered so to speak sure. and uh, then they extended the call to me. I came from uh, across the border in, in a lot of different ways, I'm finding, as I came from Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> and, uh, but that, that, uh, the job description and, and the responsibilities seem to fit the gift sets that I bring to the table. And where do you see the school going? And where do you see the potential, uh, what it's doing today, yeah. the potential, what could happen? Well, um, we got a great start. And we have a really nice facility to work in, and, and I think one of the things that are that's uh, real interesting within Martin County, there's not another uh, private school, there's not another uh, Christian high school. So I mean, on a couple couple different um, avenues or, or paths, we got we don't have a lot of competition from that sure. perspective. There are other schools, and there are some other very good schools in the area. So academically, that's going to hold us accountable. To the fact that we got to maintain an, a level of academic excellence, um, but in terms of looking for a, a school that has a, a private, conservative, moral, Christian foundation, um, that's our niche. That's our difference. And uh, I think when you take a look at culture as a whole, you know, it, it seems to have a tendency to be, well, moving more secular. I guess you could say mm -hmm. maybe more humanistic. And uh, we are certainly. Uh, the push in the other direction um, to maintain more of a solid moral foundation and so on and and I think parents would look for things like that um, in the area and certainly some people don't agree with that but that's the beauty of living in the United States exactly. that we have that privilege and opportunity to teach what we do and share what we do and have the freedom to to do that. 
Sure, very yeah. impressive. Yeah. And some of the things going on, gentlemen, in the school that you think separates uh, as far as activities or includes uh, like they do in other schools, uh, highlights, um, uh, uh, certain classes, that sort of thing that are going on. Yeah, they've added a lot of curriculum over the years, including mm -hmm. the media thing that we talked about earlier. Sure. And uh, the athletics, the uh, extracurricular activities went from, you know, no gym, no extracurricular, basically, and, and uh, we've got pretty much a full sports program. Some of it is uh, in conjunction with other uh, uh, public schools. Sure. But uh, the, 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 the students have an opportunity to participate. The, the one thing I, I think that the school excels in is the music program. They have really come a long way from the early days and the uh, instructor is doing an excellent job of preparing the kids to, for vocal and instruments and uh, they, um, are, they do an excellent job and I think that's a real plus and how many uh, students do you have in the school, would you say? Or not say, how many do you have? Uh, presently, we are just under 50. I think we have 49. Okay. Um, and then hopefully, the school is really best suited to operate, um, I would say, probably on, around 60. We have one class presently that's, that's pretty small that has kind of bent our numbers a little bit. But um, taking a look at the, charting out the history of the population of students, we've been anywhere up to... I think we started with 19 right. in the very, very first yeah, year. Two, sure. two classes at and, 19. Yeah, and then we've been up uh, over 80, I want to say pushing 90 to 100. Wow. So there, and that was there was only one year that spiked up that high. But I, I think on average we've been probably 60 to 65 oh, students impressive. in the area. And uh, that's a, we are, are set for a school of that size. Mm -hmm. Now, not that we can't grow or wouldn't like to grow. Um, well, certainly that, that would be pretty exciting. So tell us. How many graduates have you had? Well, we've had 422 up through last year, and then again we have 18 more that will be graduating here this spring. Paul, how does your school maintain a degree of excellence? Uh, that's a great question. I think one of the things that um, we use is something called an accreditation process, and that's something that both secular schools and, and private schools and Christian schools, generally all of them will do it in some capacity or another. Um, there's something called the National Lutheran Schools um, accreditation process. And what that is, is it's a, it's, a, it's a list that allows you to come together and take a look at all your curricular areas, all your extracurricular areas, all of the capacities that make you a school, and put it under the microscope. And then come together and, and say, well, here's where our strengths are, here's where our weaknesses are, here's where our deficiencies are, and, and here's where our, strength, and our, our over, overall strengths and promises are all that stuff together and then come up with a plan to make it even better yet and then there'll be a there's a team that will come through and evaluate it so outside eyes come in sure. and kind of give you the stamp of approval this world is changing and science is changing and, and all these things are changing we need to keep up on that and that's where this accreditation process helps us to maintain that edge on uh, on those subjects but we also have an area that I think is uh, very important, and that is that we don't change in some areas. Primarily in the fact that we are a Christian school and that we uh, teach all of our subjects with a Christian perspective. We don't deviate from that. We also have a chapel. We have uh, uh, Bible study, we have prayer in church in their school, and uh, these are all things that <clears throat> the public school can't have. Well, the passion you both have for your organization is very obvious and very impressive. The organization itself truly, in our opinion, is making a difference. That's why we wanted you on the show today, and I want to thank you both for coming on and joining us on Making a Difference today. Great job, gentlemen. Thank you Great. for sharing that thank with you. us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Connie. We salute these and all organizations that are truly making a difference in our communities. This has been Connie Anthony, and we will see you next time on Making a Difference. Mm -hmm.